There's nobody like my Jesus. There's no name that can heal and deliver and change and transform like the name of Jesus. And it's by his authority that we operate in the Holy Ghost to see his will done, not my will, but his will come into fruition. Amen. Amen. It's by that powerful, almighty name of Jesus that we are saved, that we are baptized into the family of God. It's his name that's called over you that makes us family. Amen. 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 I'm so thankful. I'm so thankful for the name of Jesus. Amen. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, music team. I so appreciate you and the, the spirit of God, the atmosphere that has been set by the worship, by the praise, by the prayer that takes place before service ever starts. Amen. We're going to turn to John chapter 10. I see many faces that are new to me and I haven't maybe had the chance to meet you. My name is Melissa Frost. I'm a member of the pastoral staff here at the Apostolic Church of Belleville and it's so nice to have you among us. Faces I know, faces I don't know. I'm so glad that you all are here and I look forward to meeting you. I do encourage you, if you're a guest among us, first time or second time or third time, come join us in the hospitality suite after service. I'd love a chance to get to know you uh, and meet you uh, in person. John chapter 10, verse 1, I'm reading from the King James Version. It says, Verily, verily, or truly, truly, I say to you, he that entereth not by the door into the sheepfold, but climbs up some other way, the same is a thief and a robber. Somebody's trying to get into the sheepfold, not through the door. They have ulterior motives in mind. They're a thief and a robber. But he that enters in by the door is the shepherd of the sheep. To him, the porter or the doorkeeper opens the door. The sheep hear his voice and he calls his sheep by name and leads them out. And when he puts forth his own sheep, he goes before them. He leads them. He guides them. And the sheep follow after him because they know his voice. A stranger will they not follow. But they'll flee from the stranger for they know not the voice of strangers. Today, I want to treat a little bit, teach, preach, whatever you want to call it. I'm going to treat a little bit about hearing the voice of God, hearing the voice of God. Brother Brian, would you say a prayer over this sermon right now? name in Jesus name. Amen. You may be seated today. Hearing the voice of God years ago, uh, when I was deputizing, some of you may remember, I, I preached a message about the benefits of having a shepherd, the benefits of the shepherd. And I talked about how the shepherd goes before and prepares the way and leads the sheep and makes sure that everything, uh, that, that they're, they're, they're protected from the enemy that would rise up against them. The shepherd works hard to protect each individual sheep and all the sheep. And so he's doing exams of each individual sheep to make sure that the sheep is in good health and trying to make, uh, uh the best possible life for the sheep that are under his care. And I love talking about the good shepherd. I love to talk about our God, our father as our shepherd. And something uh, happened the other day that reminded me of this particular passage or this concept of God as our shepherd. I, I got a phone call on my cell phone. And on my cell phone, you know, your contact will come up, whoever's calling you. Unless it, I'm getting more and more of those scam likely calls. Fortunately, this was not one of those. It said, it said, Ruth Frost, which is my mom. And it had her picture 
in the window. And so I answered the phone and I said, hey, mom. And I fully expected to hear her say, hey, babe, I just called to say, because this is our pattern. I answer the phone and she says, and I, and I say, hey, mom. And she responds and says, hey, babe, I just called to say. This is the pattern that we're in. This is what my mom and I do. And so I answered the phone and I said, hey, mom. And I heard this deep masculine voice say, actually, Melissa, it's Chad. Oh, okay. And it took me a couple seconds to put it together in my head. See, Chad is my financial advisor, who's also my mom's boss. And they work in the same office. And so my mom's office number is in her contact under her name, but that's not who was calling me. <laughs> Chad was calling about one of, my account, um, one of my accounts, and so I don't talk to him very often. I talk to him maybe once a year about my accounts. He just gives me a little update of what's going on, and I say, okay, I'm not going to touch it, leave it alone, let it do what it's supposed to do. That's how, that's how I talk to my financial advisor, and that's it. So when Chad's voice came on the phone, it was shocking. It was jarring because I expected my mom's sweet little voice to say, hey, babe, I just called to say. If anybody else was on the line when my mom's face comes up, anybody else, it doesn't matter if it was male or female, deep voice, high voice, any other voice I would know, that's not my mama. I know her voice. I've, I've lived with her for a great portion of my life. I know her voice. I know her voice when she's happy. I know her voice when she's sad. I know her voice when she's worried. I can tell when she's angry. I know her voice that when I was a little girl, she was just about to teach me who I really was. <laughs> Put me in my place a little bit. I know her voice. I know, I know her voice before she even says a whole word. Just one little syllable. And I know who I'm talking to. Sometimes just how she breathes on the other end of the phone. I, I know who I'm talking to before she ever says a word. Why? Because she's my mom and I know her. And I know her voice. Think about your own life. Maybe you can think, particularly moms, Sometimes dads too, but moms, if your child is in the middle of a sea of children on a playground and they're all saying, all of them are saying, hey mom, look at me. Hey mom, no hands. Hey mom, look at this. And you don't even turn around till it's your baby saying, hey mom, no hands. And you know, that's your kid. Why? Because you know their voice. You know their voice. I can look to some of you husbands and wives. You can be in a crowded room and your spouse is across the room and they turn and they say your name. Across a crowded room. And you hear them. Why? Because your ear is attuned to their voice. You've practiced for this moment. With hours of phone calls, when you were dating and you couldn't stop talking to each other and it was, oh, you hang up. No, you hang up first. No, you hang up. You know what I'm talking about. You know that voice. That person can't hide anything from you when they're, when they're in the same room. They can't, they can't whisper to a friend and have you not here because you know their voice, right? You know their voice. It's the voice of your beloved, and you've tuned up your ear to the resonance of that sound. You're listening not just to them, but you're listening for them, and you want to hear what they have to say. How does this happen that someone's voice becomes so familiar to us? God engineered us like this. He created us to, at the more familiar we get with someone's voice, the more we hear it, the more clearly we hear it, the more distinctly we hear it. Have you ever worked with somebody that um, maybe has a very strong accent? It takes you a little bit 
to, to when I when I moved and, and lived in Quebec, different accents on French, and I had my American accent on French, and it takes a while to get to an understanding. But then once you have clear understanding of what that person's saying and how they speak and how their accent is, there's no going back. You know it. You know their voice. And so you spouses, you've spent lots of time chatting with each other in those first few months of getting to know each other, your likes and your dislikes and your dreams and your interests and your favorite whatever you were talking about. All those exchanges that grow your intimacy and grow your knowledge of each other and you talk for hours and hours and hours and you just have to share. You want to know and you want to be known. And so this exchange is going on and all of that time, all of that uh, interaction, you're listening to the voice of your beloved. That voice becomes special to you and familiar to you over time. It doesn't happen overnight. You know, someone that you meet once calls you. You're like, Who, who's this? I don't, I don't, I'm, where, where did we meet? What is this? But someone who's familiar to you. Someone you've spent time getting to know that voice. Exposure breeds familiarity. Exposure to that voice breeds familiarity. It creates a sense of common knowledge, common ground, familiarity. And Jesus is saying that his sheep, the sheep of his pasture, know his voice. Why? Because they've been in his presence. They've sought him out in times of trouble or fear. They've run to him for safety and security, and this is still true of sheep. Sister Kayla, if we can, if we can cue up that video, we're going to try. I always throw curveballs. You know me. I always throw technology curveballs to our team, and they are always amazing to step up to it. So Sister Kayla is going to play a quick video uh, of sheep hearing some strangers, and then finally their shepherd. There's nothing like the voice of the shepherd. Nothing like the voice of the one who takes care of his sheep. Calling Now, they, you may not have been able to hear, but they were using exactly the same word that he was using. They were saying exactly the same thing the shepherd was saying, but the shepherd used his tone 
and his way of saying it and his style. And as soon as that started to happen, sheep from the back country start to flow in. And all of them came to hear their shepherd speak. They respond to the voice of the shepherd because he's the one they know. He's the one who feeds them and takes care of them and provides for them and protects them. And he's the one who checks on their health, makes sure their babies are doing okay. Most of them have known this shepherd for their entire lives. They know his voice and he can be across the field, lift his voice and they'll run, run to him. Did you notice they ran to him? They ran to him. And yet, every imitation, all three of the initial voices were not heard. Did you see the sheep? They ignored him. They ignored them. They just stood there like, who are are you and why are you talking to me? I don't know you. I don't know. I don't know your voice. I wish we had a little more of that in us so that when other voices start to speak, we just stand our ground and say, I don't need to listen to you. You're not my shepherd. You're a stranger. I'm getting ahead of myself. A lot of people have asked me over the years, how do I hear the voice of God? How do I know when it's God talking to me? Or just me talking to me or the enemy talking to me? How do I distinguish between those voices? And Paul was teaching in 1 Corinthians 14, we are surrounded by hundreds and thousands of voices every day. Every day. There's always someone wanting to get your attention, wanting to give you their message. And so Paul was teaching, he was actually teaching about kind of the order of of service and and, and government in the church, but he said the statement that's applicable here in, in 1 Corinthians 14.10. There are, it may be, so many kinds of voices in the world, and none of them is without signification. What that means is there are a lot of voices saying things in the world, and they all have a meaning and a message that they want to impart to you. There are a lot of voices out there. And we have to get really, really good at knowing the voice of our shepherd. See, if I know the shepherd's voice, then I can tell who is not the shepherd. But if I, if I haven't spent time with the shepherd and I don't know what his voice sounds like, I can easily become confused about what voice is speaking to me. But when I'm with him and I know him, And I've heard him and he has spoken to me. I know what his truth sounds like. And I can tell it's like, it's like we've talked about this before. The bank teller does not study all the kinds of counterfeit money. They study the real thing so that any kind of counterfeit can be easily discerned. When you know what the real thing feels like, when you know what the real thing smells like, you know what that ink looks like. You can tell when it's a counterfeit. And so Paul says, look, there's a lot of different voices out there. And as Christians, I need, as a Christian, I need to know to be able to distinguish between the voice of God and the voice of a stranger. And so just real quick lesson on the way God speaks. There are two Greek words in the New Testament that talk about the, the voice or speech of God. Logos and rhema. Logos, L-O-G-O-S, Rhema, R-H-E-M-A. That's how we uh, spell it in English. So the Logos is the all-encompassing eternal word of God. This is what John said when when he said the word was with God, the word was God. And then in John 1.14, that word, that Logos became flesh and dwelt among us. It is the all-encompassing creative word of God of God, the logos. 
When we talk about the Logos today, we often will say that the Logos is represented in this, in this book, in this Bible, that this is the all-encompassing word of God, that that word, that creative ability took on flesh and dwelt in, in the earth as Jesus Christ. And then there is the rhema. The rhema is the in-the-moment quickening voice of God through the Spirit communicating to us. The rhema is present. The rhema is now. The rhema is where we find things like individual direction, inspiration, illumination of the Word of God, where you're reading the Word and then all of a sudden it's like somebody turns on a light switch and you see something you maybe never saw before quite that way before. It's been there the whole time. But the rhema word accompanies the logos word, and all of a sudden we see an illumination of understanding that we didn't see before. Doctrine, this is very important, doctrine is born out of the logos. What we believe about salvation and who God is, is born out of this book. Like I said, individual inspiration, individual direction can be born out of the rhema, out of the in the moment direction of the spirit, where he speaks to us or he makes us to understand something in the spirit. But we don't put, we don't find doctrine in the rhema. We cannot build a doctrine of truth from an in-the-moment voice. Why? Because we are fallible. And the enemy is cunning. And he can speak something. Paul said he's transformed himself into an angel of light at times. There are entire doctrines founded on the words of angels while Paul said, look, if I or any other angel come to you and speak something that's not logos, let him be accursed. So we don't take doctrine from rhema words. We take doctrine from logos words. Both the rhema and the logos are given by God. Both the rhema and the logos are given by God. And so as a Christian, I should expect to hear the voice of God. God is still speaking. God is still speaking. He never stopped speaking to his people. God is still speaking. And I should expect to hear his voice. Now, how I hear his voice. First, and foremost, the Bible is the written word of God. It is the writing down of what the voice of God has spoken in generations past. It's a profitable book. We read it in faith and we read it with purpose. I, I, I don't necessarily, you know, how, how you do this on occasion, maybe that you open it and just start reading, but I like to read this book with purpose. God, take me somewhere purposeful. What word do I need to be studying? Maybe I do a word study. Maybe I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to trace joy through the scripture. I'm going to trace grace through the scripture. I'm going to study with purpose to learn more. I'm going to look at the nature and character of God. I'm going to study with purpose. In 1 Timothy 3, 16 and 17, it says, All scripture is given by inspiration of God. It's profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. Again, doctrine comes from Scripture. It's profitable for doctrine. That the man or person of God might be perfect, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. Now, I have had people look at me, Sister Becky, and tell me, you know, God has never spoken to me. Why won't God talk to me? God has sent over six, uh, 66 books and over a thousand pages of written word to speak to us. God has spoken to you. Each and every one of you. God has spoken to me. 
And when I pick up this book and I begin to read, I have to realize that this scripture was given by inspiration of God. It was written from his voice. And so when I read this, I'm hearing the voice of God. We're in a current generation that has elevated the work of the Spirit to the point that it, it opens us up for uh, misdirection sometimes because we're not rooting ourselves. There are churches that don't root themselves in this word. I'm really thankful to be in a church where this is the foundation. This is what we come back to week after week after week. This is where we live in Scripture. The work of the Spirit is very important. But in, in, in first point, this, this word is our foundation. And oftentimes when the rhema speaks to me, it's because I've been in the logos. I'm opening this book in the rhema. The, the in the moment voice of God will speak to me or make me understand something. Secondly, so the, the, the book is the foundation. Secondly, our God is unchanging. And so if it's the spirit of God that's speaking to you in real time today in a rhema word, his voice will always align to the logos. The voice of God will always speak in current moments in alignment with this book. That's why I have to know it. That's why I have to study it. Because if I'm going to know the voice of my shepherd and be able to distinguish the voice of a stranger, I got to know what this book says so I can compare every other voice that speaks to me to the word, to the logos. If God, if I feel like God speaks to me and it contradicts the doctrines of the word, that's not God. That's a strange voice. That's a strange voice. And I have to know the difference. The voice of the stranger will always lead you away from the teaching of the word of God. Eve in the garden encountered a strange voice. Now, what's interesting, and the devil still has this tactic, that the snake, the serpent, took a little bit of truth and twisted it. Do you know that's the definition of perversion? Twisting. It's twisted. He perverted the truth and led her to believe a lie. The twisting of the truth comes from a strange voice. Strange voices will always start with the words of the shepherd. Just like our guest shepherds I start with the same word of the shepherd but it sounds a little different there's a twisting there's a a changing of what the shepherd would actually say and those strange voices are just imitators of the one true good shepherd I've got to know the logos in written word and God's character and nature from his word so that I can compare every voice I hear to what's being expressed in scripture. Rhema word, God's voice in real time, will always inspire you to get closer to God and to do his will. Hear that. The rhema word, the in the moment word of God will always inspire you to get closer to God will draw you closer, not farther away. The rhema word will always inspire you to get closer to his people, not farther away. Why? Because we are one body. The rhema word will always inspire you to do his will. This is where you, you feel that inspiration rise up to, to pray with somebody. The devil's not going to tell you to pray with somebody. It's the last thing he wants. 
You, you feel that draw to the altar. You see someone and you, you start to feel that pain or, or, or suffering that they're going through. And so God moves on you with compassion to pray with that person. That's, that's a rhema understanding of their need. It could also be called a gift of the Spirit in some, in some manifestations. So the rhema will always draw you closer to God and will always call you to do his will. The rhema word provides that illumination on the spirit or on the scripture as you're reading. This is we're, we're, we're celebrating the hundred hundredth uh, anniversary of the apostolic truth being brought to Belleville. Um, if you look at the history of the apostolic church and the restoration of apostolic doctrine, it's very important to understand they were not receiving new revelations. They were receiving illumination on what God has already said. I'm going to say that again. The, the apostolic church of the 20th century that was born out of searching scriptures and praying for truth and trying to get beyond a historical creeds and the decisions of historical councils, they were not looking for a new truth. It was not a revelation. It was an illumination of what already exists, that our God is one, that he is, has come to earth in Jesus Christ, that if we, are, if we repent of our sins and we're baptized in Jesus' name, we will be filled with the Spirit of God and with the power to overcome in this life and move to the next in Jesus' name. That is not a revelation. That is a light being turned on to the word of God as it already existed. The apostolic doctrine and the Pentecostal experience, the biblical view of the doctrine of the Godhead and discipleship and transformation that's supposed to happen was an illumination to the people who sought it out. And we saw it give birth to a great apostolic movement that I'm privileged to be part of. Today, illumination is just what it sounds like. It's God shining a light on something in his word so that I see it differently, I understand it differently, and hopefully I apply it differently as a result. Amen. John 16, Jesus said that the spirit would lead us and guide us into all truth. All truth. I want that. I want God to lead me and guide me into all truth. And I don't assume that I've arrived because he's still showing me things. He's still bringing things to my attention. He's still calling out scriptures to me. And it, it's like I never read it before, but all of a sudden, because he knows I'm ready for it, he calls it out as I'm reading. Amen. Not many people... And maybe there are some in this room, but not many people have heard the voice of God with their physical ears. Not many. There's some in scripture. There might be some here. I, I'm not one. I don't know that I've ever heard the voice of God with my ear, but I've heard him in my spirit. I've heard his voice very clearly in my spirit. When I was called to preach, the Lord spoke to me. He made me understand what he was calling me to. When he called me to move to Quebec, to pastor a church there, he spoke into my spirit and he made me to understand the calling he was placing on my life. It was a rhema word. Now, when God did that, I didn't just go do what I felt like God was calling me to do. I went to my pastor I said, here's what I feel like God's calling me to do. Now, the pastor knew before I did, the Lord was calling me to preach. He knew three years before I did. He said at one time, he said, when are you going to get your license? And I laughed like Sarah. Are you kidding me? <laughs> That's not for me. But pastor knew. God will show our under shepherds things that the good shepherd is preparing for us. And so I went to my pastor and I said, Here's what I'm feeling about going to Quebec. And he said, that, that's perfect. That's awesome. That's what I feel that too. Let's, let's move forward. And, and, and it, it took years. I don't know how many of you know, but I, I actually got called to Quebec in 2012. I didn't get there till 2016. 
It was years of preparation and years of dedication and years of making sure that I was aligned to the good shepherd's plan for my life. And so when, when a rhema word comes, there's a process to follow. Now, sometimes that rhema is, you know, praying with somebody in the Holy Ghost. You need to make sure you're prepared for that. I'm going to be real honest. I don't want just anybody laying hands on me and praying for me. I want a prepared vessel who's repented of their sins and who's flowing in the actual Holy Ghost. We need to make sure that we're prepared for what God wants us to do. The Spirit of God, the Word of God, are and should be speaking to us, especially in these last days. We're getting close to the end, folks. Jesus is getting ready to part the sky and come back and gather his church. We're getting toward the end. And so we have to tune up our ears to hear the voice of God. Just like you spouses did. You, you get used to that voice. You, you seek after that, that interaction, that communication, that voice of God. And it starts always right here. Now, I'm going to come back to you spouses for just a minute. Let's just imagine, ladies, that your husband goes away with his buddies on a hunting trip. Gentlemen, your, your, wives, uh, your wife goes away with the girls for a, a girls shopping weekend. Totally stereotypical there. Sorry about that. But while your spouse is away, their bestie or their buddy is texting you, letting you know how your spouse is doing. Well, Brother Brian, Hannah got up this morning, and she's feeling good, and she had breakfast this morning, and then we're going to go shopping, and here's our agenda for the day. And it's, it's the friend texting you instead of Hannah texting you. And all the weekend, you get all kinds of updates from Hannah's best friend, or his, her sister's probably in this case. They're texting you and they're calling you and letting you know how Hannah's doing, but you never all that weekend hear from Hannah. Do you think that'd be a little weird? It's a little strange. Especially if there's a, a guy up in a tree stand texting Becky saying, well, Mike's over in the other tree stand. I can see him. He's doing, he hasn't fallen out yet. He's doing okay. He's sleeping. But would that be strange that Mike never texts you or calls you or contacts you while he's away? But many of us come to church and we're perfectly content to let somebody else talk to our beloved and hear from them and then come to this pulpit and tell you what's on God's mind. We come in on Sunday and Wednesday and expect the pastor or a member of the pastoral staff, or another minister, or layperson among us to share the word of God. Because they've spent time with him. They've been in his presence. And we, we're okay with them just sharing what's going on with God today. While God wants a direct path of communication with each and every one of us. There's a sea of voices out there. I want to know his voice. I also want to know my pastor's voice, but I want to know the voice of God first. Our human nature is always going to resist looking to God and turning to his word. I think that's something that as a young Christian, I didn't understand that it's never going to be easy to make your flesh pray. It's not going to be easy to make your flesh, flesh, it's time to read the Bible. There's always going to be a struggle. Why? Because the flesh wars against the spirit. It didn't say, you know, the flesh kind of maybe fights a little bit. <laughs> the flesh wars against the spirit. No, don't make me do that. I don't want to do that. I don't want to be disciplined in this. I don't want to have to talk to God. I don't want to have to submit. I don't want to have to obey. That's always going to be your flesh. But I just want to hear the voice of my shepherd. 
And the only way I'm going to hear his voice is if I get in his presence and search out his word. John 4, 1 says, Beloved, believe not every spirit, but try the spirits, whether they are of God. Not, not every spirit, not every voice deserves your attention and your adherence. I was listening to a sermon not long ago. And the preacher said, how, how does a stranger's voice become a familiar spirit? The same way your spouse became familiar to you, you listened. And you kept listening. You kept coming back to the voice of the stranger. And you kept entertaining the voice of the stranger. Until you could no longer tell who was the stranger and who was the shepherd. There's a reason they're called familiar spirits. It's because we've been making ourselves familiar with them. We've been listening to the stranger's voice. Who are you listening to today? Do you know beyond the shadow of a doubt that the voices in your life align to this word? And that what you're paying most attention to is the voice of your shepherd. Let's all stand. John 10, verse 3, and the sheep hear his voice. And he calls his sheep by name. He knows you. He knows your name. He knows what needs you have. He knows what's going on in your life. He calls his sheep by name, and he leads them out. And when he puts his own sheep out to the pasture, he goes before them, and the sheep follow him. Why? Because they know his voice. A stranger will they not follow. God, give us that spirit. I'm not listening to anybody else. I'm not giving my attention to any other voice but yours, Lord. I want to know your voice. A stranger will they not follow, but they'll flee from the stranger because they know not the voice of strangers. And in verse 27 of the same chapter, Jesus says, My sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me. You want to be one of Jesus' sheep. You need to know his voice, and then we follow him. We follow him. It's not enough to just know who's talking to us. It's that response to come when he calls and to run in his direction when he's reaching out for us and to follow him when he's leading us out into green pastures. Whose voice are you attuned to hearing today? There are thousands of voices, but Jesus, I really want to hear your voice. I want your word to reign and rule in my life. I, I don't want to be called out to, the, to a strange pasture by a strange voice. You know, lately... I've been in, in, in just doing my own thing, doing whatever I'm supposed to be doing at home or, you know, doing the dishes or cleaning or vacuuming. And it's, it's just been a powerful moment that Jesus has just come and said, come, come away with me and talk to me for a little bit. Interrupt what you're doing. Interrupt your schedule, Melissa, and just, just move over here for a minute and give me some time. And I believe that we're in a, in a season of the earth's timeline where he's doing that more and more and more. But I have to be sensitive to his voice to hear that. And when he calls, I, I have to follow him in response. They know my voice and they follow me. Oh, God. Oh, God. Let us be sensitive. If what you came for today 
is a renewal of your sensitivity to his voice. I invite you to come and pray up at this altar. This is a demonstration of your faith and your response to his word. When he calls, I'm going to follow. Won't you come today and seek after him and seek his voice and let that tuning up of your ear happen. God, make me sensitive. Make me sensitive to your voice that even in a crowded room, I can hear you speak so clearly because I know your voice. Oh, Jesus. Oh, Jesus. Make me sensitive today. Would you find a place to pray and talk to your shepherd today? In Jesus' name.